Hey everybody, it's Dr. May. Um, I'm going to start a new uh, four-part video series today, and it's all going to be about attachment styles. Okay, so um, we're going to start with secure attachment today, but I'm also going to do a little intro about what attachment is, just so we're all on the same page. Okay, so this is mostly focused on secure attachment. Okay, but what is attachment in general? Okay, you might have heard that term in a few different contexts. In um, more of a mindfulness context, attachment is about clinging. It's about holding on too tight to things that we really need to let go. But in this context, we're talking about attachment in terms of relationships, okay? So an attachment this initially describes the way we bond with our caregiver, right? So we form relationships with a baby and mother or a baby and a caregiver. And that influences the way we later feel about ourselves, the way we feel about others, and the way we have relationships, okay? So it starts with us really, really little, okay? And the way we develop our attachment style is really like an adaptation. So we have to, because we're completely dependent on our parents to take care of us, we have to adapt to how they are in order to secure their you know, caregiving of us because we need parents to survive, right? So based on how they interact with us, we, our nervous system uh, makes adaptations, okay? And there's four main ones, and those become our attachment styles, okay? So attachment, in a lot of ways, is influenced by our appraisal of the parent's sensitivity and responsiveness to our physical and emotional needs, right? So a parent might be actually there a lot or you know trying to attend to us but if we appraise it as something that's working for us and that's good we could develop secure attachment but if it's not a good fit for us and we don't appraise it as enough or or really attuned it, we could develop insecure attachments okay um so our attachment style also in adulthood which i'm mostly going to focus on today um kind of depends on who we're with you know, it's not necessarily a quality of myself, right? Um, I could be having a certain attachment style with certain people and a different attachment style with other people. And even under certain circumstances, I might shift a little bit from one attachment style to another, okay? Um, and also, one of the good things is, especially if you have more of an insecure attachment style, it could be changed in adulthood. It's not fixed for your whole life. So that's the good news, right? So while we develop our initial attachment style in the relationship with our caregiver, we could improve and upgrade our attachment style when we have healthy relationships in adulthood, right? So that's the good news. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can do that um, during this attachment video series, okay? So here we go. Um, so just to kind of give an overall overview, so there's four major attachment styles, okay? And like I said, today we're gonna to focus on the healthiest one, which is secure attachment. So that's the peppermint patty side on the left. So as you can see in this chart, they kind of divide it up into high proximity seeking and low proximity seeking. So you're, you're looking for closeness with somebody versus not really caring about too much closeness. And also on the uh, X axis, low anxiety of abandonment, like it doesn't really matter to you if someone just walks away, versus high anxiety of abandonment, right? You really freak out if somebody left you, right? So based on the combination of these different axes might depend on the kind of attachment style you develop, right? So the secure attachment, the healthiest one, is anxious ambivalent attachment, which is also called preoccupied attachment in adulthood. Then um, Schroeder, is anxious avoidant attachment, also called dismissing attachment in adulthood. And Charlie Brown is the disorganized attachment or the fearful attachment, which is what it could be called in adulthood. Okay, so I'm gonna have four videos, each one going over a different attachment style, but again, today we'll focus on secure, okay? All right, so what is secure attachment? It's hard to really get a really clean definition because the, you know, I, I, I'm gonna go into a lot more about it in the slides to come. But just as a general overview, um, again, it's the healthiest style. Um, and it's the kind of relationship that helps the child feel more secure and understood and calm and helps the nervous system develop most optimally. Like your brain gets sculpted in the direction of connection because the connection was very responsive and available. So it made sense for your brain to develop that way, right? 
Um, so you feel more safe. Um, you you're feel like you have a secure base in your parent. And so there, you, therefore, you also feel comfortable exploring your environment, right? And then you can touch base with your parent again and explore again. Um, you have more of a healthy self-awareness because your parent was able to reflect back to you what you were like and what you were feeling. Um, you're able to develop healthy trust, really important, and empathy because you were given empathy. So therefore, you're then able to express empathy to others, okay? But a lot more detail to come. So, so passing your seatbelts, okay? Um, so qualities of secure parents. So let's start that way because... You know, the parents are really the ones who the grown ups that are initiating the attachment style and the child and the responsiveness to their to their baby. Right. And a lot of times we end up putting forward the attachment style that was given to us. So let's say if the mother was responded to by her mother in a secure manner, she developed a secure attachment style as she grew up. And then when she had a kid, she's able to relate to that child and in a secure kind of a way. So the child becomes secure, right? We kind of pass it down from generation to generation. On the flip side, if our parents had insecure attachment, then they probably are transmitting that to us as well, okay? So here we go, qualities of secure parents. Okay, so secure parents are validating, right? So if you're in DBT, you've heard the term validation, and that means that you could put yourself in someone else's shoes and kind of understand where they're coming from. So secure parents are pretty good at doing that with their kids, okay? So um, it starts out that they're resourced, what they say. So if the parent has you know, their stress level under control and they have adequate support in their life and they have good coping skills for stressors and emotions, then they're resourced, right? And they're able to then give of themselves freely to their child, okay? So feeling comfortable doing that they're able to be present with the child, okay? They could be sensitive to the child's needs and cues. They're facially responsive. Um, they know when their kid is cranky. They know when their kid is hungry. They know when they need changing, when they're tired. Like they have a, they could pick up the cues from the child and respond appropriately, right? Um, Non-verbally, they can mimic their facial expressions, taking the child's lead. And they kind of feel like, they're, they're welcoming of the child. You know, they're happy they're here. Um, they, they look at them with kind eyes. Um, they use a nice, soothing, prosodic voice. Prosodic meaning like very melodious voice. You know, when you talk to a baby, hey, honey, how you doing? You know, that's a prosodic voice, like kind of melodic and sweet. Um, they offer safe and affectionate touch, right? And as we know, it's so important for babies to be held and touched and rocked. And when it's done in a really soothing, caring way, it helps promote, you know, the, the, you know a secure attachment, right? We kind of need that. So you're kind of attuned to the child. That's the main thing and validating. Okay. So secure parents are also good communicators, right? Not always easy to communicate with little people, especially before they're able to talk, right? But um, they engage in what they call collaborative communication. So like both parties are contributing, right? They're co-creating this relational moment. And the parent shows the child that he or she is interested in kind of getting to know the child. I'm interested in what you're feeling and thinking and experiencing. And whatever you're experiencing is allowed, okay? Whatever you're feeling is okay. Maybe not every behavior is okay, but you know, they, they wanna to get to know the child. They wanna show them that they're allowed to be their full selves, okay? Um, so that's about making the dialogue inclusive. So everything that they want to say and experience and show is included in the dialogue, okay? Um, another thing they talk about is scaffolding, okay? So basically that means like, let's say that little boy is about three or four, okay? So he's slowly developing his ability to communicate, right? But the parent is at a higher level. So the parent is slowly you know, trying to get the kid to communicate a little bit better. Like maybe get a little bit better expressing his feelings or a little bit better at putting his experiences into words. And so she hears what he says and tries to upgrade the dialogue just a little bit more, right? So that's scaffolding. Like she's encouraging further development in a healthy way, okay? So good communicators. Okay, another really important aspect of secure parents is that they're good emotional regulators, okay? So when kids are really little, they don't have the ability to just soothe themselves, right? To do their own emotion regulation skills, right? Way too little. So parents have to 
be the ones to help them regulate through their touch, through their voice, through you know, the way they talk to them. So there's an interactive emotional regulation. We're also called co-regulation, okay? What they also do is they can kind of tell the difference between the kids' different kinds of moods, and then they respond differently to the different types of moods that the kid's displaying. So if you have a kid who's sad, you might respond one way and help the kid understand that this is sadness. If the kid is very angry, you might respond a little bit of a different way and help the kids see that this is anger, right? So by your different responses to different emotions, you help the kid differentiate between different types of feelings. It doesn't just become, I feel bad or I'm upset, right? It becomes a more nuanced experience, okay? There's also um, a concept called mirroring, right? So it's like I'm attuning to what the kid's expressing and I'm kind of reflecting back through my nonverbal and verbal response what the child is feeling, okay? And by doing that, I help the child understand what he or she is feeling, okay? So if that girl in the picture is crying and sad, the mother might make a little bit of a sad face while she's trying to soothe her, okay? When it says here contingent and marked, it sounds a little funny, but let me explain what this means. So contingent means like my response to that little girl is contingent upon what she's putting out there. So if she's crying, I'm gonna give an appropriate response to the crying. If she's happy, my response is gonna be contingent upon her happy emotions. It's, it's gonna reflect what I'm gonna put out there, okay? And it's marked meaning I'm gonna also help to modulate it, right? So while the girl's crying, I'm not gonna start bursting out into tears myself and, and exacerbating her upset right? I'm, I'm going to soothe her in a responsive way, but also help to calm her down at the same time. I might be like, oh, okay, honey, it's okay. Don't worry, sweetie. We'll get through it, right? So it's appropriate. It's contingent upon her response, but it's also marked because it's helping to modulate it, okay? Kind of get that? All right. All right, next. Um, secure parents are also capable of setting limits and following through with limits, okay? So let's say, you know, kids just want to try all different stuff, but not everything they want to do is appropriate, right? So you have to set some limits on their behavior to keep them safe and secure. So secure parents are okay with saying no to a child when necessary or telling them, you know, these are the rules and we have to follow the rules and enforcing them appropriately. Not too harsh, not overly punishing, but, you know, in a loving kind of a way, okay? And when there's ruptures in the relationship, let's say, you know, the, the child's mad at the mother or the mother's mad at the child or something happens and they're upset at each other. The mother's able to initiate, I'm sorry, I'm saying mother, but it could be any parent or guardian, okay? Sorry, I don't mean to exclude anybody. But the mother, let's say, could initiate working the, through the feelings, okay? So like, listen, I, I know you're upset. I know we had a bad day, but I still love you. I know even though you messed up, you're, you know, we still can get through this. We're, you're still my favorite little girl, okay? You're still really sweet on the inside, but we all make mistakes, right? So it's kind of like showing that a mistake's not going to destroy the relationship. There's not going to be a threat of abandonment for screwing up, that we can work things through and still love each other, even though we're flawed and we make mistakes, right? So it kind of gives you confidence that like, you know, we can get through stuff in relationships and it's not just going to be all over every time there's a problem, okay? All right. And also, I'm sorry, I forgot one part. Um, so if the child tries to apologize and initiate a repair, that the parent is able to graciously receive it, right? So if the kid makes that effort and says, I'm sorry, mommy, I shouldn't have put my hand in the cookie jar, the mom says, okay, thank you for apologizing. Okay, we'll just learn from it, okay, honey, right? So you could receive the repair also, all right? Not like, sorry, it's not good enough, and that's, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, all right? Okay, so... If you grew up with those kinds of that kind of parenting, right? Chances are um, you grew up to be a securely attached adult, right? So now that you're grown up, what kind of qualities do you have? All right, so that's going to be this next section. Okay, so people with secure attachment are pretty good at emotional regulation. Okay, so because they were allowed to have a full range of emotions, and their guardian or parent allowed them to feel different things. As an adult, you can also allow yourself to feel different things. You don't have to exclude any emotions and make any of them feel like they're not okay, right? So all of them can be things that you could radically accept, all right? 
um, because you were nurtured and mirrored and held in all the kinds of ways that are you know helpful, um, your nervous system is more regulated and you're wired for connection, okay? Um, you have more, what they say, high social emotional complexity, right? So if I'm allowing all different experiences in there, it makes me much more nuanced and complex, right? Than if I only had a small, narrow range of emotions, like anger or calm, <laughs> right? That's not very nuanced. It's very kind of black and white. Um, I could also feel and deal while relating to other people, right? So I could experience my emotions in the presence of a trusted other, and I could manage them and, and modulate them enough so that I could keep an interaction going. Right. So I'm not going to blow someone away with my anger or, you know, scare them off with my, you know, intense neediness or at rage or whatever it is. Right. I'm not going to run away and have to hide from people when I'm feeling stuff. I could be present with somebody and still allow my feelings. OK, so that's more possible if you have a secure attachment. Um, also, um, given your ability to work through ruptures in a relationship and to manage your emotions, you tend to be more resilient in the face of stress, right? So you have better resources and coping skills to get through some tough times, okay? And people with secure attachment are actually less likely to develop PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, if confronted with a major stressor. So like if you were in 9-11 um, and you have secure attachment, you're less likely to develop PTSD from it than if you had insecure attachment, okay? So you're more likely to work it through, okay? All right, so next. So people with secure attachment tend to have a good mind-body connection, right? So just like all emotions are allowed, all physical bodily experiences are allowed as well, okay? So there's an integration of mind and body. You feel safe experiencing your emotions and safe experiencing sensations in your body, right? It doesn't freak you out if you have sexual feelings in your body, okay? or if you have certain pains or a stomach ache or tingling, or it doesn't freak you out. You don't have to cut off your body to be okay. You're allowed to fully be in your body and experience it, just like you could fully experience your emotions. You could also have the sense that my body might be communicating something to me, right? If I feel tightness in my chest, it may not just necessarily be that like I'm getting a heart attack. Maybe it actually means I'm a little bit tense right now or you know, I'm feeling some anxiety. There's meaning to my physical sensations, okay? And it's not just all a medical model. And also similarly, I could understand how my emotions could then influence my body, right? Like if I realize I'm under stress a lot today because something's going on at work, it makes sense to me that I got a headache. It's not just out of the clear blue sky where the tension and the headache have nothing to do with each other, right? They all kind of hang together and I could see the relationship, all right? Next, um, there's a cool acronym from a guy named Dan Siegel, who does some attachment work. And he says that people with a secure attachment have a safe self, okay? So safe stands for stable, adaptive, flexible, and energized, okay? So that kind of makes sense based on what we were saying before, if you think about it, right? So if you're more emotionally regulated, you're much more stable. Um, you could, if you've been through repair experiences and you know you could survive stress, you're much more adaptive and flexible. And energize is like having a healthy level of energy, right? You're not really depressed and sluggish and you're not manic -y and overwound up, right? You're kind of like in a kind of medium, nice energized kind of level, okay? So that's kind of, kind of more a healthy sense, right? And also on the bottom, I wrote, um, hang together as an integrated whole, right? So when all the parts of yourself are allowed, you're kind of not riddled with inconsistencies. You're kind of like making sense, like all the different parts work together, um, you're more consistent across situations because you have a stronger core, okay? All right. Um, another quality of people with secure attachment is that you're just as comfortable being alone as you are with other people, okay? So it's, an, and when you're alone, you can have a nice healthy quality of solitude. And solitude is comfort in being with your own company. And it's a peaceful state of being alone and enjoying it, okay? You're not freaked out about being alone and, or, be, or lonely, okay? And you're also comfortable with other people. You, uh, you know, like you, you're able to be in relationship, you know, and have comfortable, easy relationships. Um, you're okay with separation and reunion, right? So you're not overly anxious about people 
going on vacation or leaving or you know going to work or going to the store like it's okay if people leave you for a little while because you trust that they're going to come back okay and so it doesn't create a big rupture within you um also you're able to do self-regulation so you can regulate your own emotional state physical states but you're also comfortable reaching out for help and accepting co-regulation with other people so you're allowing other people to also help you calm down when you're not able to do it by yourself right so you're you're giving yourself flexible options for coping okay and you're also able to get along with a wide range of people right so if you're really struggling with your emotions for example certain people might really rub you along the wrong way and i'm not good with authority and i'm not good with this kind and i'm not good with that kind and there's a very narrow range of people you can get along with but when you're secure attachment you're much more flexible with the kind of people you could hang around and you could kind of adapt to different personality styles and stuff like that so you could you know kind of be more okay with a wider range of people all right another important thing people with secure attachment are capable of true intimacy okay so true intimacy is essentially when two people who are each whole within themselves are then able to connect with each other okay it's not like um feeling fragmented and i need you in order to try to feel whole right i'm already whole but i could take my whole self and then bring it into a relationship with you okay um, I found a good definition by a woman named Teal Swan, who I kind of like, um, and I'm just going to read this to you, okay? So true intimacy is to see, feel, and hear the other person, and to truly be seen, felt, and heard by them, right? So you're allowed to bring your whole self into the relationship and have it seen, feel, felt, and heard by the other person, and vice versa, okay? Intimacy is knowing and being known for who we really are in all aspects of our life, right? So again, bringing our whole, whole self there without having to hide parts of ourself. Um, it's the bringing forth the truth of who you are, the center of the relationship, and being received for who you are, and the other person doing the same. So I could also do the same for the other person. I could accept them exactly as they are and not just make them a project <laughs> like that, someone I'm gonna fix and then they'll be okay, right? I could accept the you know, the positives and the negatives of myself and the other person and know that we could still have a relationship despite our flaws, okay? It's also involved feeling worthy of receiving love, okay? How many times we struggle with that, right? So you feel like I could let someone in because I'm worthy of receiving love because that's how my parent made me feel when I was developing my secure attachment, right? That they were glad to have me and I was worthy. Um, and I was also allowing myself to be vulnerable in relationships, right? So I could let my guard down and be my true self with somebody that I trust, okay? I don't have to keep walls up and all that kind of stuff, okay? All right, so in, in essence, um, you could enjoy yourself in relationship. You could relax with other people. It doesn't become like a, a very anxiety-provoking situation to be around others, okay? So um, some important adjectives here. So you could play, right? So these people in the picture I picked, you know, like they're probably having fun together. They're exercising, they're hanging out, right? You feel protected and connected. Um, you feel empowered from a deeper sense, not just a false power. You feel a sense of joy, you know? You enjoy being with people. And you can laugh together. You have a sense of humor, you're having fun, right? Um, you're able to experience trust. You're able to have reciprocity, so there's a give and take in relationships, and mutuality, also kind of a give and take. Um, you can be compassionate, empathic, and able to show kindness and love, right? So we can empathize with each other, kind of read each other's thoughts and feelings, you know, kind of reflect it back to each other, validate, all that kind of stuff could happen. Um, there's also a term they call co-mindfulness. So with co-mindfulness, while I'm with people, okay, I could tune into myself, I could tune into the other person, and I could tune into the relationship itself. So I'm able to have that open awareness quality of mindfulness where all of it is able to be in my awareness, okay? And I'm safe, I feel safe enough to allow that to happen. And also, talking about mindfulness, relationships are more informed by what's going on in the here and now rather than what I'm digging up from my past history and projecting onto the current relationship, right? So if I'm interacting with some guy, 
I'm just interacting with that guy right now. I'm not thinking of how he reminds you of my brother, my father, my uncle. I'm just interacting with this person, in this individual person in the here and now, right? Without digging up the past, okay? All right, next. Um, because you've had the experience of interactive repair, where you're able to work things through, it allows you to be more optimistic about your relationships, right? You don't necessarily go in thinking it's doomed to fail, right? They're just gonna leave me anyway because I'm not good enough. Or we're just gonna get into a fight and then it's just, we're never gonna fix it, right? You feel optimistic, like we're gonna be able to work this out, okay? So, um, and you believe that other people have, you know, are, are more likely to help you, they're more likely to wanna be with you, and you're less likely to give up on people. Right, and you don't think they're going to give up on you. You're more, you have a more positive view of how other people are going to treat you. Okay. All right. Another thing is, um, just like let's say I had a parent who set limits with me, if I'm securely attached, I could also now take that ability and feel comfortable setting and enforcing boundaries in my adult relationships. Okay. So let's say I have a partner, or I have friends, or coworkers, or bosses. I'm able to use that limit setting and bring it into my relationships and feel like it's okay to do that. Right. So if you're in DBT, this is about using the fast skill. Like I, I've kind of mastered the fast skill for self respect, and I'm able to have self respect in my relationships and therefore feel okay with standing up for myself and, sta and living by my values and saying no if something's not right for me. Okay, without worrying that it's going to totally destroy the relationship or make people mad at me and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so the opposite of that, right, is let's say, when they say being a shadow giver, like over giving, giving because that's the only way people are going to love me if I just keep giving, 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 right? Or getting too codependent or being a rescuer because no one's going to love me unless I rescue them, right? Um, I'm also going to be respectful of other people's limits. I'm not going to force myself on other people. I'm not going to suck the life out of somebody like a vampire or a narcissist. And I'm not going to like unleash my rage on someone like a bully. Okay. So I'm going to relate to some people in like a moderate kind of a way, in a respectful manner, assertive manner, um, keeping respect for myself and the other person. Okay. All right. So next part, this is going to be several slides on this. Secure people generally have a healthy thinking style, okay? So if you look at the stuff that's to come, all these qualities can actually also be developed with mindfulness. So if these thinking styles, these healthy thinking style things don't come naturally to you, it's not all over. We could always work on changing our thoughts. But for people who happen to be lucky enough to be securely attached, these kind of thinking styles come naturally. But if you want to be more securely attached, be earned secure, you could also work on your thinking and help recreate that. Okay. And the more you practice mindfulness, the more this starts to develop. Okay. And I'll help explain that along the way. I do have another video called healthy versus unhealthy thinking. And I do go over this there as well. But if you haven't seen that, I'm going to go over it here. Okay. So here we go. So secure people have flexible thinking. All right. Flexibility is a sign of health. Okay. So we're open to new information, we let stuff in, and we have flexible attention, so I'm not overly fixated on one thing or zoned out. I can kind of shift my attention as appropriate, okay? And I'm able to change my mind. It's not like once I have an opinion, I could never change it. If I get some new information and it looks like I should change, I'll change, okay? Flexible. Um, I realize that we realize our thinking is fallible, right? Just because I think it, it doesn't mean it's true, okay? So I might realize that, you know, I know I believe this, but there's a chance it's not true, right? Um, or maybe I got misinformation. And I might realize that I'm also seeing the world through the filter of my experiences or my emotions, and therefore might have some distorted thoughts, right? So I have awareness that this is happening, okay? Um, I also may know that um, this beliefs change over time. You know, things that I believed 10 years ago, maybe I don't exactly believe anymore because I have more life experience, right? Things change. Um, and also knowing that our knowledge is incomplete. So you're not walking around like you know it all, <laughs> you know, that I know may know a lot about certain things, but I'm always leaving room for like, you know, mm, there's still some stuff I don't know, okay? Like, listen, I, I know what I know, but I could always learn more, right? Being a little humble about it. Um, there's a thing called metacognition. So it's like literally thinking about your thinking. So I could step back and just watch the kind of thought patterns I'm having and say, oh, that's interesting, look what's going on right? 
huh, it's like that guy on the right looking at the, the, the thought cloud bubbles coming by. Oh, I'm having a thought about anger. Oh, I'm having a thought that I should really wring that guy's neck. Oh, I'm having a thought about what a beautiful day it is. Huh. Gee, I'm wondering if I'm believing this too strongly and it's not really true, right? So I can reflect on my thinking. I don't just buy into the thinking as if it's the truth, okay? Metacognition. Okay, self-reflection. So super important in therapy, right? If you wanna learn and grow as a person, you gotta reflect on what, what's going on with me, right? I have to rather think about, well, what, what are my thoughts like? Are, are they working for me? Um, am I managing my emotions okay? You know, am I holding the kind of values that I really wanna hold? Are my actions in line with my values? You know, what was my real motive here? Was I really just trying to be altruistic or did I really wanna get something from that person? Right, so kind of being able to step back, self-reflect, um, the quality of secure attachment, okay? And then therefore, by being able to do this, it gives you the great advantage of having more insight and self-understanding, right? So when you understand yourself better, it gives you a lot more tools to be able to, you know, make better decisions about how you want to prove, improve, okay? All right, another thing is that we realize there's different perspectives that, just because I see something one way, it doesn't mean everybody does, that other people with different life experiences might see it very differently. And just because we're different, it doesn't mean one's right and one's wrong, right? That their perspective could be valid. And, you know, I could understand why it makes sense, but it just might be different from mine, okay? So uh, kind of like these pictures here, right? This two people in the different pictures or two different perspectives, and, you know, they both might be true, but um, you know, people just see it differently. Okay? Um, being able to distinguish from appearance versus reality, that you gotta look beyond the surface. It's not just a superficial understanding of things, right? Just because someone seems nice on the surface, it doesn't mean that their intentions are good or they're actually a nice person. They might be a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? People could lie, they could say things they don't mean just because they're trying to achieve a certain goal. Um, and people might, look one way, try to disguise their emotions, and maybe hide what they're feeling because they're afraid that showing what they're feeling isn't gonna work for them in that situation, right? So it's kind of looking a little deeper, very related to validation because validation is about looking deeper, okay? Another quality of secure attachment is that you have more empathy, right? Because you were shown empathy and your caregiver was able to read your signals well and understand your thoughts and feelings, you now have the capability of doing that with other people which can make you a much better friend, partner, mother, father, whatever, right? So empathy is very similar to validation, about putting yourself in someone else's shoes and trying to like, you know, feel with them, really understand what they're feeling and thinking based on, you know, everything that they've been through. Trying to understand based on their history, based on what's going on with them now, you know, um, based on, you know, the level of coping capacity. Why are they feeling this way? Or why are they acting this way? Right, so kind of going that deeper exploration about somebody. Okay? Um, we also could understand and imagine how other people see us, right? So we know that people could make assumptions about us, they could judge us, they could say not so nice things, but they could be wrong, <laughs> right? They're just coming from their own vantage point. So just because they say something, it doesn't mean it's true. And although, you know, they can't know what I know, they can't read my mind. They might say they're reading my mind, they might tell me they know what I'm feeling, but they don't really know, right? And I'm able to step back and, and realize that even as it's happening, or maybe shortly after it happens, and not just be like, oh my God, he told me this, uh, right? I'm able to see, all right, well, other people will have different views of me, right? And we know that other people respond to us based on their own stuff, right? Like if somebody thinks I'm spoiled, I may not actually be spoiled. He just might be coming at it because he had bad experiences with being spoiled or being jealous of somebody or something like that, right? That's his stuff. It has much more to do with him than me, right? Um, and also, I, people may see us differently for how we see ourselves, right? And that's okay. Maybe they're giving us some extra information we can incorporate. And maybe what they're having to say doesn't make much sense at all. It's totally based on their stuff. But we're able to differentiate and kind of sort this through, all right? All right, so now finally, um, I wanted to touch on what they call earn secure, okay? So like I said in the very beginning, if you didn't grow up with a secure attachment style because of whatever the reason, okay? And now you're struggling somewhat now because your self-concept, your relationships are impacted, you still have the chance 
of developing secure patterns now, okay? And just as your insecure patterns developed in relationships, secure patterns can develop in relationships. So they say that if you get into a relationship with somebody who has a secure attachment style, you could start to shift and become more secure over time by being with that partner or being with that person. This can also happen in a therapeutic relationship, especially a more interpersonally focused relational kind of therapy, because then the interactions are more of the focus and your therapist can help guide you toward more secure attachment style, okay? Um, I also heard recently um, a suggestion that you could watch shows and movies that help portray secure attachment relationships. So you can kind of feel it and witness it on the show. And one of the main examples they gave was This Is Us, which is actually a really well done show if you haven't seen it. But um, there's a, a lot of family dynamics, but there's a lot of secure attachment in there, okay? And finally, another thing that helps is to work on your coping skills, right? So as you can see, this healthy thinking styles, this emotional regulation, this good interpersonal skills, right? This mindfulness that helps with the thinking styles because mindfulness is about observing your thoughts and watching your thoughts and that kind of stuff. So by exercising those skills, it helps you move toward earned secure attachment, okay? So um, in the videos to come, I'm going to cover the other three attachment styles, and I'm going to give also specific guidelines and suggestions on how you could move from each of those specific attachment styles towards secure. Okay, so these were just some general things at the end for secure, but other ones will be more specific. Okay, so I hope that made sense. I hope it helps and it gives you some ideas about directions you can move in for your own self and relationships. All right, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. All right, bye guys.